We've reached number 30 in this video series, and I have a lot of fun making these. I plan to make a lot more. And I just want to say thank you at this point to all of you out there who watch these, the, the growing number of people, and for all your enthusiastic emails and your comments. I couldn't do it without you, and I really appreciate it. Something I do from time to time is I stop, I sit back from my work for a minute, and I ask myself, what my job is. What is my job? I think it's important as a painter to every now and then redefine your position, your job description. Um, I'm a landscape painter. I do many other things. There are certainly, there are certainly a, a conceptual elements, expressive elements, the notion of abstraction, other things that feed into my work. But at the end of the day, when I hit the pillow, I'm a landscape painter. Chuck Close is a portrait painter. Uh, Philip Guston, in my eyes, is a figurative painter. Even in the early, the 50s and 60s, the abstracted works all had a squirming corporeality that to me is redolent of figurative painting, and, and certainly that comes into fruition in the, the later work. Um, Jay Leno is a stand-up comic, even though he does other things. Um, someone like Art Carney or, or Jim Carrey, they're clowns. They also happen to be actors, but they're clowns. That's their job. Uh, James Turrell. Certainly he works with, with, uh, with space and with light and with earth, but at the end of the day, I think he's a sculptor. He deals in the ambu ambiguities of light and in three-dimensional space. Um, so, so for me, I think clarity is the key word here. Clarity of thinking, clarity of purpose, clarity of intention. As a painter, I think it's good to, to imagine yourself standing on one toe and then reaching up in all different directions. As, as opposed to laying on the floor splayed out in all different directions. Start with that very clarified, very singular position. What is your job? Uh, ask yourself that. For almost my entire life, I've been interested in sideshow, in the variety arts, in con artists, uh, grifters, pickpockets. A lot of my buddy painters are interested in that as well. And what I, what I love about the art of pickpocketing is that unlike other areas where there's a method in service of an effect, in pickpocketing the method and the effect are the same thing and both moves are concealed. And this I think is where it dovetails with painting. Uh, in painting we're not using paint in service of an image to render something, but rather to try to embody something in the stuff, in the paint, uh, using paint as a thing in itself. And that's why I think it's so important to see a painting in the flesh, skin to skin, skin of the viewer to skin of the paint. When I'm painting, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm painting a tree. I don't think at all. I simply stack color until there's a feeling of treeness there. And if you look up the definition of con artist, which comes from confidence artist, you'll see it's that which exploits human characteristics like lust, greed, obsession, uh, credulity, dishonesty, naivete, every single one of those things fitting handily into the job description of a painter. Uh, painters invented the exploitation of those things. This is a photograph of Todd Robbins and I, and Todd is an original American carny. He performs uh, all over the world, but he's based here in New York, um, and I follow his career and try to see him as much as I can. And, and it, it, it brings to mind what Jed, Jed Pearl calls the necessity of the unnecessary. There's no intrinsic value whatsoever in watching a man stand on stage under a spotlight and eat and swallow a light bulb. It doesn't tell me anything about the performer, but it does tell me a little bit about myself, about, about my perceptions, about what's possible. Uh, it also intensifies experience for a moment and I think sharpens my sense of acuity, my, my, my visual acumen. And I think those are things that a painting does as well. It intensifies experience. And, and it does what I think is so very beautiful. It speaks about the misplacement of priorities. I love misplaced priorities. Uh, while, while, while I was learning how to paint, learning color, learning art history, uh, the sideshow performer was learning how to eat glass and, and swallow swords and nail, nails into his nose. Um, I love anyone that's really good at one thing. Uh, so, so a sideshow performer to take something that appears fake even though it's actually real. Yes, they are really swallowing a sword. Whereas a stage magician, for instance, takes something that appears real and is actually artificial. And it speaks to the notion, I believe, of what we do as painters. We create a series of artificial conditions which hopefully give the viewer a very real experience. What Picasso calls using a lie to tell the truth. So there's the notion of misplaced priorities, of artifice, and, and I think the, the, the realm of 
of sideshow of sideshow performing, which I which I find a very interesting area of study uh, in my in my ongoing learning. Uh, uh, if, you know, a con artist takes something that's very, very easy and makes it appear difficult. A real artist takes the very difficult and makes it appear effortless. My wife and I hate camping and we adore our children so we take them often on camping trips with friends. I had a horrible night's sleep. In fact, the last time I had a night's sleep that bad was the previous time we went camping. And as I lay there shivering and wet, I was thinking about the notion of containment and, and being shielded from nature. I love that idea with, with boots and tents, bug spray, sleeping bags. Uh, and as a kid, I would take a box out into the woods and cram it into a thicket of leaves and branches and then crawl inside the box. And stay there for a while and, and even though I was outside I was contained in that interior space and I think that relates to the work I do today I think all painting in some sense is a form of containment and in this painting which I'm currently working on you can see this very tight fisted area of, of thick ropey purple brush marks. Um, what am I trying to contain here? Uh, the beginning of the painting was uh, purple. The underpainting was purple. And then I'm putting this fist of brush marks in purple back at the end of the picture. So perhaps in a, it's an attempt to contain the arc of the painting, the history of the painting that you're looking at from beginning to ending. And that kind of brush mark might come from looking at someone like Henri Michaud, the Belgian poet and painter. This is from the 50s. Certainly there's an Asian influence with the ink on paper, and, but there's, there's all, I'm interested in the, the marks, the, the containment of the marks themselves, pulling into the center, away from the edges, uh, inside this proscenium, uh, just slightly off center, both static and animated at the same time. Uh, relating also to Joan Mitchell, uh, this painting much more, more, more virulent, more coagulated. Also the color is an element here, uh, the higher contrast colors toward the center, less so at the edges, and then a pulling away from the edges into this this tight fist of brush marks uh, containing some sort of external experience in some sort of way that's internally uh, viable. Uh, this is a painting by William Lamb Pinknell from 1895. I love this picture. And I ask myself, what is he containing here? The artist and the viewer are put into a fixed vantage point just at the edge of the road where it becomes rough and drops down into the river. Uh, there's clearly a, a beginning and an ending through the single point perspective. It almost feels like, like it, if one were to, to extrapolate into a, a political statement, a good government, there's checks and balances. Uh, there's a beginning and an ending. Uh, there's, a, there's a method and, and a result. Uh, because of that single point perspective, the predictability of that. I took this detail of the ground to show the artist using a method in service of an effect. He's using pale pink and yellow and very thick brush marks to give you the impression of the earth below our feet. But I think the real emotive reach and the intensity of this painting is not in the marks themselves, but in the overall design represented in that beautiful linear perspective. If you contrast that with Winslow Homer, uh, I think the gap between the method and the effect is much closer together. The what is closer to the how, which is why he was so far ahead of his time. I think, I think the emotion and the intensity in this painting is mangled and contained in the marks themselves. And he's using atmospheric rather than linear perspective and also very strong dark and light contrast and diagonals to give movement or give the impression of, of the possibility of movement. Uh, so to take Take my, my analogy to his logical conclusion, uh, Picknell is a magician, whereas Winslow Homer is a, a pickpocket. Here's a close-up, and in and, and this, again, I think it illustrates Homer not using paint in the service of something, not trying to render the ocean, but trying to give you a, a nose full of salt water. Very present, very direct, very visceral. If I've learned anything from the French Impressionists, it's that dark is not just the absence of light, that dark has to have its own spaciousness, its own vitality and luminosity into itself. Here I'm mixing quinacridone red, Indian red, and phthalo blue. Again, trying to get different versions of darks, uh, darks that will help reflect and resonate some of the lighter areas in the painting that I'm currently working on. 
when I was a kid, I would go down by the Waccamaw River to some of the brick manufacturers and ask to watch them make bricks out of clay and water. But it was a particular kind of Carolina clay, and it, it gave these beautiful, bloody brick colors, which I still think of when I mix paint today. Here I'm mixing cerulean blue, dioxazine purple, and Portland gray medium. And again, trying to find ways to lighten my values without using white. And I'm enjoying Gamblin's Portland gray series. It gives a beautiful kind of clay purple, a clear-eyed purple color. And I'm showing you paintings that are unfinished, which is stupid, but like a real studio visit, that, that's what happens. I was with a friend of mine in the Whitney Museum of American Art looking at the Hopper Drawing Show and we came across early Sunday morning one of his seminal paintings from 1930 taken out of its frame and placed on one of his original easels up on a pedestal in the museum. And I always, my first thought is always how lonely and, and antiseptic it looks taken out of the realm of the artist into that context. But I realize how very important it is. It's the museum's job to generate scholarship and to try to give people, uh, non-painters, a glimpse into the workings of the world of the artist. Uh, which have remained essentially the same for a thousand years. I feel a great deal of pride and, and continuity in the fact that we use those very same tools. And I always get a little choked up when I see that. I, I, I don't think of him as some paragon of virtue. I think of him as a relative. Uh, oil paint is thicker than blood. We're all related through this, this weird thing we do, through these misplacement of priorities, this thing we do every day in our studios. And, and when I'm with people looking at paintings, especially non-painters, and they say something like, oh, I could do that, when we're looking at Barnett Newman, for instance, I get really pissed off. And, and I say to them, no, you couldn't. In a million years, you could never do that. And, and I, I want to say, okay, first come up with a concept, and then I want to take you down to my studio, a thousand square foot studio, in front of 10 blank white four by six canvases, and then I want to give you a palette with three pounds of, of paint divided in opaques and transparents, some mediums and some long hair bristles, and say, okay, asshole, dazzle me. Make a body of work that's clear-headed, that has a, a concise conceptual framework, and that is put into visual form that, that's resonant and rich. And then do it again, and then again, and then again, and build a body of work. Uh, no, you couldn't. No, they couldn't do that. Um, you, you and I know how hard it is, how much work it takes, but, but it's also, it's also the, the, the most fun I think one can have. It, it's, it is a struggle at times, and I struggle awfully. I scrape things down and tear things apart all the time, but it's in the privacy of my studio. No one will ever see it, and, and no one will ever get hurt. I love the fact that in painting, you, it, how many other areas in life can you, can you completely you know, pedal to the metal uh, and, and just go absolutely crazy and nobody gets hurt at all. No one dies, no one gets hurt, no one really cares in the end. Uh, and I find a great deal of freedom in that. So uh, uh, w the beauty about painting, I think, is that it's, a, it's, it's kind of its own way of celebrating life by cheating death. Mm -hmm.